Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Fluently Forward. Today, we are talking about the latest series that has been on everybody's mind, and that is the Quiet on Set series, which came out over on Max. What's going on? You know, from Twitter to X, from HBO to Max, like, I don't know, people are just loving the letter X and it's not catching on, but it was in fact on Max. If you want to watch it, it's four episodes and it covers this insidious world of the Nickelodeon programs and also just like child actors in general, which is something that obviously we've talked about here on the show. If you've been listening to Fluently Forward for a while, you've heard the name Dan Schneider before. This series covers Dan Schneider, Brian Peck, all of these um, abusers and pedophiles that worked at Nickelodeon. So today we're going to be covering a little bit of the docu series. You know, even if you haven't watched it, I suggest listening. I'll kind of summarize it, but you, you should go watch it for yourself. It's, um, I think it's an important watch. And then I'm also going to be doing a deep dive on Dan Schneider, who was the quote unquote golden boy of Nickelodeon. He created all of these shows. He was doing all that. The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, Victorious, iCarly, Sam and Cat, and then a show called Henry Danger, which I think was his last show. I don't know anyone who's seen it. Anyway, then we're also going to end with a little bit about Drake Bell, who was in Drake and Josh and all that. And one of the big news pieces from this docuseries was that Drake Bell came forward as a child who was sexually assaulted and abused by one of these Nickelodeon employees, a man named Brian Peck. So obviously, as you can just tell, oh, we're also going to end with a little bit about Alexis Nichols, or Nicholas, Nicholas, her last name always confused me when I read it. Um, she was an actress on Zoe 101, child actress, and she has been very vocal speaking out against Nickelodeon, what does she call it? Sickelodeon. And she has a company program now called Eat Predators. She's in the docuseries and she's also covering a lot of it. After I watched the docuseries, I was looking at different podcasts and interview clips of all of these child actors and stars, um, you know, reacting to what was going on. She is over on her YouTube channel. She's covering Dan Schneider's apology. She's covering how the cast of Ned's Declassified made just really insensitive comments about all of this. She was live on YouTube when I checked her out. So go check out her channel, Eat Predators, if you want to hear a little bit more. She's got some background information there. So anyway, as you could probably guess, there's a huge trigger warning for this episode. Like we're not talking about sunshine and rainbows. We are going to be talking about some dark stuff. So before we get into the Dan Schneider deep dive, I just want to talk a little bit about the Quiet on Set docuseries, some things that stuck out to me and what it covered. So the docuseries covered a lot of different aspects. They covered how poorly the adults were treated at Nickelodeon, specifically the writers, specifically female writers. They talked about how inappropriate a lot of the scenes were were with kids, how sexual they were, all of the foot references, the kind of scenes that would mimic cum shots that these kids would be doing. And then they also talked about Dan Schneider and specifically the sexual abuse. So the first thing I want to talk about is the creepy things that happened for kids. And Dan Schneider really comes onto the set of Nickelodeon with all that. And that was their kids version of SNL, basically, where it was sketch comedy shows. I mean, I had seen a little bit of all that growing up as a kid. I thought it was such a cool show. I thought it was a cool concept. It had that cool edge, which sounds insane because watching it back, I'm like, oh, these were toddlers on the show. Well, like, why did I think it was so cool growing up? These kids are like seven, nine years old, whatever. But Dan Schneider is the creator of the show and he's working with kids on it and it becomes apparent that Dan Schneider has kids who are his favorites and those are the kids who typically are white. We're, we're going to talk about that, the racial discrimination at Nickelodeon as well. And these are kids who are very funny and willing to work long hours and go farther and do you know, potentially uncomfortable scenes, really push themselves to the limit. And these kids are in all of these different sketches, but a lot of them are making these kids uncomfortable. And a lot of what this docuseries talks about is that these kids are the breadwinners of their family sometimes. So they feel like they can't speak out or say that they want to complain or change something or that they feel uncomfortable because A, Dan Schneider was this very 
abusive, volatile boss to work for and you didn't ever want to get on his bad side. I feel like we all knew someone like that growing up. For me, it was my cross country coach. Um, And then secondly, there's this kind of looming fear of I am making the bulk of the money for my family. Like I, I can't let them down. Now, this docuseries talks about a lot of the weird sexual things that happened on all that. And when we did our Ariana Grande episode, it was a public episode a couple weeks back. I put in some of the clips of Ariana Grande in Victorious where she was being sexualized. There's a scene where she's trying to put her foot in her mouth where it looks like she's jerking off a potato to try and get juice out of it, where she's pouring water on herself upside down and it's like getting in her mouth and she's choking. And I feel like if you've been online, you've you've seen a little bit of that Ariana Grande content. I, I didn't know that it went all the way far back up until all that, you know, years before Victorious was on the air. So one of the child actors here, he was talking about how one of the first times he remembers being uncomfortable on all that is when there was a script for him and he had to play a character called Nose Boy. So they put him in a superhero costume and he says that they were always putting him in tights and leotards and he felt uncomfortable. Like he's a kid, he's about to go through puberty. He doesn't want his whole skin tight business out there. But for this sketch of Nose Boy, they put him in a superhero costume and they give him a prosthetic nose, this like big nose. And then also on each of his shoulders, they put a version of a nose. And the nose, you know, you have that bridge of your nose and the two nostrils. It looks like two penises on his shoulder. It, it really does. Like, there's no way nobody couldn't catch that. It's very obvious. And in this sketch with Nose Boy, he sneezes and this white, clear goo shoots from his nose onto someone's face. So not only are there penises on his shoulder, but he's mimicking the motion of like a cum shot in this scene that was written for him by Dan Schneider and adults at Nickelodeon. And this docuseries puts together all of these, you know, when I watched it as a kid, I missed this. Of course, kids aren't going to know what it is, but Jamie Lynn Spears from Zoe's 101, she's getting goo squirted on her face. Somebody else is getting ketchup squirted on their face. There's all of these cum shot like scenes in these Nickelodeon shows. Anyway, they talk a little bit more. You know, I don't want to cover every single thing in the docuseries, but they talk more about just how the kids felt like they had to be Dan Schneider's favorites. Dan was very volatile. He could be super nice and complimentary to you one day and then incredibly volatile, angry, and berating you the next day. And then Amanda Bynes comes into the picture. She's on all that. She is just this young talent. And it was really incredible to watch because I feel like everybody nowadays thinks of Amanda Bynes I just kind of hadn't been thinking of her in the past couple of years because she was kind of giving me, you know, Britney Spears effect where like I read an Instagram caption of Britney Spears and it's just so incoherent and I can't understand it that it doesn't make sense to me. So I I just kind of forget about it. And I feel like that's what's been going on with Amanda Bynes in the past couple of years, or at least to me, like when somebody seems like they're doing unwell and it's known that they're doing unwell, you don't really want to, I don't know, like be poking around or looking at what they do with some sort of spotlight or magnifying glass on it. So I haven't been paying attention to Amanda Bynes in recent years. Obviously, I know that she's struggling, but seeing this footage of her in the docuseries, in the show, all that, and the Amanda show, it was so jarring because Amanda Bynes was such like a young, fresh-faced talent. She had the it factor. She had the charisma. She had the comedy chops, both physical acting as well as comedy slapstick humor. She could do it all at a young age. I mean, they have a clip of her in the docuseries doing a stand-up routine at I think age 10. And she is confident. She, oh my God, I was just about to say the phrase pussy out. And like, I literally cannot. Okay. That's like what I say now when people are confident. Oh my God. Now I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, my language is disgusting. I need to clean it up for this episode. Okay. She is confident. She is brash. She is so sure of herself at age 10 doing the stand-up routine better than adult comics I see nowadays. So Dan Schneider saw her doing her comedy routine, which kind of makes me want to do an Amanda Bynes episode. Like, what was a 10-year-old? I didn't even know that 10-year-olds were allowed to do stand-up comedy. I just find that wild. Anyway, he put her on all that. She was such a star on all that that he created 
The Amanda Show, her own self-titled TV series that he created and produced. And he had worked on the TV show, all that. But when he found Amanda Bynes and he created The Amanda Show, that was the first time Dan Schneider was creator and producer. And it just changed everything for him. People have all these testimonies of Amanda Bynes and Dan Schneider being incredibly close when she was working on all that in the Amanda show. You know, if you're a child actor, you have to go to school for a few hours every day. They have tutoring for you and the trailers on the lot. And a lot of times Amanda wouldn't be at school. She would be in a room with Dan pitching ideas or working on something. And they were always around each other and physical, you know, arms around each other. Dan Schneider, as we're going to get into, loved getting massages from people and she would sometimes be massaging his neck, etc. Um, she was not in this docuseries. Apparently she was asked to be in it and, you know, completely understandably, she was like, I just cannot deal with all of that right now. I, I can't even think to get into it. So we don't know her full story. It doesn't seem great. Like anybody could look at the situation and say, Every single person who worked with Dan Schneider comes away from their experience with him at Nickelodeon, traumatized, abused, scarred for life. Amanda worked more closely with him than any other child star. And she was always alone with him. And you look at her life now, like you, you don't have to be a genius to put together that something bad happened there. I I don't know what, but it's something bad. Now, at the same time that all of this is going on, Dan Schneider is also in charge of all of the writers for the show. And these are adult writers who are working on all that, The Amanda Show, etc. And in the first episode, we hear about these two female writers who worked on the show and how horribly they were treated by Dan Schneider. He made them split a salary. He would refer to them as the girls. He really minimalized what they were doing there. And he would aggressively sexualize them. He would ask them in front of everybody, have you done phone sex? One of the writers was pitching an idea and he wouldn't stop bugging her until she pitched her idea while bending over the conference table and acting like she was getting sodomized. And I understand, especially, you know, I I interned for a summer at the Colbert Report and I would sit in on some of those writer's sessions. And yeah, a typical J.P. Morgan Chase HR department would look at those writer sessions and be like, okay, this is so not HR appropriate because you're writing for a comedy show. It needs to be loose. You're throwing ideas back and forth. I even think too, when I watch SNL, you know, sometimes those characters have to kiss each other in a sketch. So the same HR rules for like a tech company aren't going to be the same for entertainment. They, they have to be a little bit more loose. That That being said, it was just absolutely, (laughs) that being said, it was just absolutely astronomical to me the things that Dan Schneider would make these women do. Acting like you're being sodomized, like that's not funny. And he would really push these people to the limit. He would also send messages over their, you know, I don't think they had Slack back then, but their IM channel. And at first it seemed like it was just to build morale, like he would message somebody, yell tomato or yell mushroom, I don't know, maybe to get the creative juices flowing or something. But then he would always be messaging the women, 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 whatever, (laughs) the lady writers, um, yell, I'm an idiot, yell, I'm a slut. And if they didn't yell it, he would continue to badger them and keep sending messages. Slut, 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 yell it, say it, say it, say it. I mean, just like absolutely heinous. Also, we get insight from these writers that a lot of the dirty jokes or the sexualized scenes in these Nickelodeon shows aren't happening on accident. Dan is aware of what's going on and he's making it happen. He's trying to push it under the radar, and he also thinks that it's hilarious. So one of these jokes is that for the Amanda show, Amanda plays a character named Penelope Taint, T-A-Y-N-T, but of course, it sounds like the word taint, okay? The skin between the anus and the balls. And Dan Schneider apparently said in the writer's room, hey, like, here's what the word taint means, here's how we're going to use it, but when the executives ask about it, make sure that you don't tell them what it actually means. And apparently when they took that, you know, character name into the meeting, the executive said, 
wait a minute, taint, what does that mean? And Dan Schneider went, oh no, it just means get your head out of the gutter. It means taint, like you tainted something, you ruined it. That's all that it means. So you can tell at this point that he's purposely trying to pull on over on the executives and trying to get these like X-rated jokes into the child's program, which if you remember one of the earlier episodes we did on Fluently Forward, I forget what the name was, but it was something about like child pedophile conspiracy theory. I don't know. That, that was like some of the things we covered. It was like creepy conspiracy theories when it comes to children's entertainment. <laughs> Here I am being like, I wonder why people called me QAnon when I first started out. Anyway, but one of those things that we talked about was all of the dirty jokes that are also in Disney programming, not Disney Channel, but the Disney movies. For example, when I'm talking about Noseboy in um, uh, all that, that image of like showing a penis was done in Hercules. When Hercules is fighting like the giant swamp monster when he first meets Meg, he hits him over the head with something and this bump grows on his forehead and there's two knuckles below it and it looks like um, dick and balls, cock and balls. What was that thing that Tati Westbrook said? Sucking dick and cock. <laughs> like it looked like that. And there are other things too. You know, apparently when Ariel or the Little Mermaid first came out, the priest had an erection when he was doing the wedding. And some people said, oh, no, it was the no or it was his knee. Other people said it was an erection, whatever. Basically, there's tons and tons and tons of references. Honestly, even Princess Jasmine, like I watch that movie now when Jafar is like, I'm hypnotizing you and she's in a bikini. I don't know if children needed to see that. But a lot of people say that the reason that penis was snuck into Hercules or when Simba falls onto the grass and it looks like sex is spelled in the grass that falls behind him. A lot of people said, oh, that was just writers or animators who were bored or wanted to pull one over on Disney. So like they snuck a penis in there. And like, I understand that. I don't know. Like, I guess adults have dirty senses of humor, but you're working on a kid's project. Like, what the fuck? Just keep it out of there. Today's episode is brought to you by Quince. Feel like a prince with Quince because Quince is how you can get luxury essentials at unbeatable prices. Quince has all of these different products at very, very reasonable prices. You can get cashmere sweaters for $50. You can get washable silk tops. They also have a ton of different other products on their website, which I personally love and use. I am in LA this week. And I'm going to be visiting Christy from X Knows All. And she reached out to me because she wanted to buy some bed linens on Quince. I have used their pillows. I have used their duvet covers. I have used their knife sets. You know, basically, it's not just clothes on Quince. I love everything, especially if you're moving into a new place and you're like, I don't want to shop at William and Simona prices. What can I do? Check out Quince. So you can indulge in affordable luxury. Go to quince.com slash fluently for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That is Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash fluently to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash fluently. Anyway, then we get to some of the pedophiles who worked on the show. I don't know why it feels weird to say that, but yeah, there were pedophiles who worked on the show. Before we talk about the big one, like the big story, this was episode three in the docuseries, there was another story. There was a crew member named John Handy. He was a production assistant, and he was this young kid, I think people said from Minnesota. When they show pictures of him, he looks like a really nice guy. And I think this is also something that's important to keep in mind. I feel like the word pedophile, you say the word, and it's so taboo we're not really talking about it. If you talk about it, you get called QAnon <laughs> anyway. Um, but when you say it, it sounds like so crazy, like a pedophile. Like that's far too crazy of a word to say. But as I've said before, like in my high school, there was a history teacher who was a pedophile and almost every single person I talked to, they had a creepy, it was either a history teacher, an English teacher, or a gym teacher. Don't tell me why. I don't know why like science, math, reading and writing never seemed to get hit with those labels, but it was almost always like a history male teacher, at least in my findings. Anyway, and I just find it crazy how like we all had that experience, but then everybody else is like, oh my God, no, like pedophiles are crazy. Like there's, there's not enough of like, there's not too many of them in the world. That's just like what people say to scare you. 
and I don't want to scare people. Like obviously, you know, there, there's nothing to panic panic over. It's not like this big beast that's coming for us, but I'm happy that docu-series like this are coming out because I think one of the things that they're helping people understand is that a pedophile can be your uncle, your brother, your neighbor, your partner, your teacher, the nice neighbor down the street. Like it, it really comes in all different shapes and sizes. And everybody said this production assistant, John Handy, just seemed like a really nice guy from Minnesota. And in all the photos, he's there smiling with the kids. Like not to say that some people look creepy, but let's be honest, sometimes people do look really creepy. Um, And we're going to talk about that when we talk about Dan Schneider, but John Handy just looked like a nice guy and he would work with the kids. He was young and there was this one child star named Brandy and she got along with John Handy like all the other kids did. And when she was leaving for break in between seasons or something, he wanted to exchange emails with her. And her mom, which everybody's given a little bit of side eye to the mom in this docuseries, said, sure, Brandy, go ahead, um, give him your email. And they started emailing and it went back and forth. It seemed normal. But one day this mom sees Brandy shut her laptop and run to her room in tears And it turns out that John Handy, which, oh my God, now I'm thinking about the last name. Anyway, sent Brandy a photo of him masturbating and said, I want you to see this because I was thinking of you when I did it. She doesn't do anything at this time. And she just keeps Brandy away from him and she doesn't send her back to set. But a little while later, the police reach out to her and they want her to testify because they end up searching John Handy's home. And at his home, they find over 10,000 images of children, 1,700, over 1,700 of them of young girls in erotic poses, um, two, over 200 images of girls in sexually explicit poses, two images of girls in bondage activity, and two CDs, one with seven video files of minors engaging in sexually explicit activity. And they also find his personal journals and what's so effing fucking creepy about this is that he self-describes himself as a pedophile in his uh, journal. You know what it was given, what it reminded me of when I watched it? When Army Hammer in his messages to girls, he would say something like, I am without a doubt a cannibal. Like I'm a full-fledged cannibal. I definitely am. And John Handy would say something like, I am a full-blown pedophile. It's that weird... I don't know. It just stuck out to me, the language of that weird, this is who I am. Like I sit strong in this label of being an absolute fucking sicko weirdo. And also this guy, John Handy, wait, was it John? Yeah. John Handy. He had Ziploc bags, not, not giving Joe Goldberg from you. He had Ziploc bags with girls names on them and little tokens that he would keep from them sometimes underwear. I think it was a seven-year-old girl. He had her underwear in a Ziploc bag. And it's one of those things too. I've heard some people say, like, should this docuseries have had, have had even been made? Like, should it have been made? That's the word I'm looking for because they're re-showing all of these images and they're surfacing them again and blah, blah, blah. And it's one of those things where it's so hard because children are involved. I remember when the Balenciaga photos came out, we all remember that scandal with the children in bondage gear as part of their campaign. A lot of people were saying, you need to blur the faces of the children. And okay, I I hope you get what I mean. I'm coming at it from a good intention here. I agree like those children should be protected. I don't want their faces out there. But also until you, and it's to a point, I don't want anyone to watch CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material. But until you kind of see what it is, it doesn't read as disgusting, which I feel like this is coming out wrong, but let me, let me dig myself into a hole and try to understand what I'm saying. When I saw the photos of those kids in the Balenciaga photo shoot, I was so outraged and disgusted. And I talked to a few people who had seen the photos, but the faces were blurred and they didn't think it was as big of a deal. And because of that, they thought everybody was just running away with the wind and Balenciaga wasn't that bad and everybody's making a big deal out of nothing. 
And I just feel like when you see the face, like you understand how gross and sick it is. And I know that it's so weird to be replaying these old scenes of Nickelodeon shows where you're getting cum shots and like the feet are being rubbed and Ariana Grande is like having water fall all over her chest. And you're hearing about the seven-year-old's underwear in a plastic bag. Like it feels really gross and like weird to repeat out loud. But I also just feel like until people know the depth of what happens, like that's the only thing that spurs people into action, into changing laws, new rules, regulations. Like, honestly, let's just make it AI and like fucking not have any kids in these TV shows. Like, oh my God, it's like, so nasty. So I don't know how I feel about it. Let me know what you think. You know, obviously I don't want to see like anything graphic, but I'm also just like, well, if you just say to somebody, oh, bad stuff happens at Nickelodeon, they're not going to be as aware and like horrified and want to make a change and a difference compared to as if they like hear about the details. But I don't want it to be too many details. I don't know. Obviously I'm in the middle of it. Anyway, so this guy ends up going to prison, uh, thank God. What else was I going to say? I feel like there was something I had here. But anyway, John Handy, pedophile at Nickelodeon, went to jail. Um, disg- oh, this is what I was going to say. And th- this is an unfortunate fact, but I feel like in all of the research that I've done about these pedophiles and how they operate, I just find it so bizarre that each time the cops go to a pedophile's house to look for stuff, it's never 12 photos, you know? It's never like two videos. It's always like nine hard drives worth of all of this shit. And these pedophiles, the way that they operate is in this like sick network where they are trading information with each other and they are sharing these items or they are making it for a group of people online. And once again, like, I don't want to like red scare panic anyone into, um, you know, pedophiles are everywhere, but it's just really, really sinister. And I remember Blake Lively, um, child rescue coalition. That's a nonprofit. I donate to monthly if they have, uh, reoccurring donations. And I really, really like them as a nonprofit. Blake Lively did a speech for them a few years back and, she was telling a story about how she talked to somebody at this nonprofit who there was a, this episode is so dark. I'm like, so sorry guys. If you're looking for like a fun thing to listen to going to work, sorry to bum you out. Um, there was a child's oncologist who was arrested for being a pedophile and abusing children. And it was snowing when they were like interrogating him and they asked him how many children he had abused And he looked outside and he said, as many snowflakes as there are on the ground. And it's just this like sick um, reality where like, you know, even Larry Nassar, Nassar or whatever with the the U.S. gymnast. It's just, it's fucking sick. And like, I, I don't know much about pedophilia and how it comes to you and how it, God willing, goes away. I have heard, uh, we did an episode about the castration conspiracy theories. And there are pedophiles who go on these hormone blockers or like they lower their testosterone and they have said that it got rid of their symptoms. I mean, who knows, whatever. All I know is that people are conducting experiments with it. But the sick thing about this disease or affliction, whatever it is, is that these pedophiles are like fucking persistent. Like it's never one victim and it's never one photo on their laptop. It's always just like this weird, nasty, gross, spread out network. So whatever. So that happened in 2003 when they searched the guy's home and put him in jail. Now, I also want to talk about too the racial discrimination that was happening at Nickelodeon at this time. There were a lot of black child actors who were on these different shows and they were noticing basically there was one um, Brian, he was in all of that. And there were different moments. Like he played a rapper called little fetus, who was the youngest rapper of all time. And when he was getting fitted for once again, the leotard, they're always putting him in these damn leotards. They, somebody on the set said the costume skin tone should be the color of charcoal. And I, you feel so bad for him when he's saying this in the docu series. And he said that there was someone on set who 
looked at him and was just like, I'm sorry, like that shouldn't have happened. But he was scared to say anything because he didn't want to face the wrath of Dan Schneider. And he didn't want to tell his mom because he thought then his mom would stick up for him. And then that would get Dan Schneider mad at him. It just sounded so toxic. And then there was also a scene too, where he's selling Girl Scout cookies, like, but on the down low. And it's reminiscent of like being a drug dealer. And it's like, okay, so you're having the black star play the drug dealer. Anyway, unfortunately, John Handy was not the only pedophile to be talked about in this docuseries. There was a man who worked as a dialect coach, and he also played like the pickle man in some of these shows where like he showed up with pickles all the time. His name was Brian Peck. And I want to say here he's of no relation to Josh Peck. I think that's just an unfortunate coincidence. Brian Peck worked on the show, and he worked with all of the kids. And like a lot of these people on the show, he's like, I love the kids. I'm really friendly with them. He would have parties at his house where everybody, kids, adults, cast, crew would come. And before we even get into the actual molestation and sexual assault, this was so fucking weird. All of the kids came to his house one day and he had a room with a painting of a clown in it. And the clown painting was obviously creepy. And he turned it around and it was signed. And the painting was from the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. And then Brian Peck shows off this little clown photo to everyone at his house and then reveals that he was pen pals with the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, and he keeps all of the letters in uh, like a box next to his bed, which is just like, look, the docuseries covered a lot of things, okay? We haven't even gotten into the worst that Brian Peck did. Being pen pals with a serial killer is so fucked up and having them paint you a self portrait like oh my god like we might have to do a mini episode in the coming weeks of like where is brian peck now and what is up with him but like what the fuck i'm sure the people who were making that documentary they knew it was going to be about child exploitation at nickelodeon i'm sure when they got that little nugget in the interviews with people they were probably like Excuse me, what? The serial killer clown? Like, that was a pen pal of one of these Nickelodeon people? It's mm, absolutely wild. Um, so then episode three, we find out that one of the stars, and I'm just saying one because it could be more, that Brian Peck sexually assaulted was Drake Bell. And they talk about this story. It's, it's just heartbreaking. And what's also creepy, too, is that he had been in the industry for a long time before he was working closely with Drake Bell. He worked very closely with Leonardo DiCaprio. And a lot of videos show him and Leonardo DiCaprio really close, just like touching each other in a way that an adult on set shouldn't be touching a child. And it's leading a lot of people to be like, like, how many people, you know, did Brian Peck basically like have a history of this? So we learn a little bit about Drake Bell and how he was involved in, in the Amanda show. And Brian Peck just like became obsessed with Drake Bell and became very close to him. And they interview Drake Bell's parents in this docuseries. And your heart breaks for Drake's dad because he was managing Drake at the time. And it seems like he was really trying to do everything the right way and above the board. He would be like... I'm going to drive you to all these auditions. I will always have eyes on you wherever you are. I've heard some, what did he say, scuttlebutt about what's going on in the industry. I want to make sure that's not happening. So he was really proactive about keeping Drake safe. And he noticed immediately, Brian Peck seemed to be a little bit too close to my son. He's touching him a lot. He's like helping him get dressed when Drake can really get dressed on his own. And he started to say to people at the studio, I want that man away from my son. And what they did was they gaslit the shit out of him. And they said, Brian Peck, well, he's a gay man. And that's just why he's touching Drake because, you know, that's part of like queer culture and he's being friendly and you might be being homophobic if you're not into that. And he was like, oh shit, okay, maybe. But even so, he was suspicious. Now, eventually, it gets to a point where Drake's dad is trying to keep Drake away from Brian Peck, and Brian Peck catches on, and like the creepy, fucked up pedophile he is, he starts planting these seeds in Drake's mind, saying, your dad is taking money from you, he's going to hinder your career, nobody likes him being on set, and he gets so wormed into Drake's kid-child brain 
that Drake goes to his mom, you know, because his parents were divorced, and he says, I want to live with you, and I don't want dad to be my manager. So Drake's dad is super upset, and he calls the mom, and he goes, okay, if that's what Drake wants, you know, I don't want to say no. He can live with you. But if you're going to be taking over his career, the one thing you need to know is keep Brian Peck away from Drake Bell. I don't feel comfortable with him being around him. Make sure that you always have eyes on him. And Brian Peck just swindled the mom and tricked her and would get Drake alone. And because they live far away from LA, he would convince the mom and Drake that Drake needed to sleep over at his house and he could drive Drake to auditions. And that was when the abuse started. And it's really heartbreaking too, because I had read some headlines about what happened and I knew that Drake had been a victim of, you know, child sexual assault. But when he talks about it in the docuseries, it was not a one-time thing. It sounds like it was, it happened a lot. And he doesn't say exactly, you know, explicitly what happened to him, but we see snippets in the court document and any type of like child sexual abuse you can think of, you know, from, I don't know, whatever, all the different types, they're all in the court documents and it's worse than I would have imagined. It, it just, um, there's like, I, I don't even know the way that he describes it. Like, I think it's worse than we could even imagine. It's, it's worse than we could imagine. Yeah. It was just really awful. And then the crazy thing is, um, you know, Drake kept this a secret for a while because he was also saying like the first night that it happened, what's he going to do? Call his mom and say, come pick me up. I'll, I'll wait 30 minutes for you to drive here. Like, and he didn't have a car. He couldn't get away. It's just like, when you think about like how these pedophiles and their mind work, it just makes you so fucking sick. Anyway, so Drake ends up getting a girlfriend and shout out to the girlfriend's mother because Drake is over at the girlfriend's house one day and Brian won't stop calling him, won't stop calling him, won't stop calling the house. And eventually, you know, after he keeps calling, the girlfriend's mom takes Drake into a separate room and she's like, what's going on? This isn't normal. And honestly, side eye to Drake's mom. Like, how did you not pick that up? But the girlfriend's mom realized what was going on took him to therapy the very next day and he still couldn't bring himself to talk about what happened to the therapist. But later on, he ends up kind of like exploding on the phone over to his mother and saying what happens. And they go to the police and he's convicted. But when he goes to court for the sentencing, there's 50 different people sitting on the side defending pedophile Brian Peck. And 42 of them, I believe, write letters of, you know, character in his honor. And some of them, you know, a lot of these were actors that like I didn't under, I think Alan Thicke was one of them. James Marsden from Jury Duty and Ella Enchanted. And oh my God, he was in 30 Rock too. Wrote letters of character. And like, sure, maybe some people didn't know all of the shit that he did. But like, what the fuck? Like, Whatever. We'll see. I'm sure people on the internet are tearing their asses apart and they're going to be putting out statements, but I'm just like, I cannot handle that. And the craziest thing too, do you want to know what this pedophile who is on trial for charges and found guilty of everything from sodomy to oral copulation to like inserting a foreign object with a minor, 14, 15, 16 years old, found guilty of all, like the worst crimes I can think of. 16 months in jail and register as a sex offender. 16 months. 16 months. Oh my God. It's like, and the craziest thing afterwards, the craziest thing is that when he gets out of jail and he had, he had to register as a sex offender, he's then hired at the Disney Channel to do a couple voiceover episodes for The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. What the fuck? It was just crazy. And I will say something that I think um, was nice is that nobody knew that Drake Bell was the child who was assaulted until this documentary came out. And I just think that 
I don't know. At, at least that's good because all the kids were wondering and Dan Schneider, it was like this creepy thing where he took all of the parents out of the room and then told the kids that Brian Peck wouldn't be coming back to the show. And all of the kids were like, oh my God, like what happened? Like, was it you? Was it you? Like, who was it? And nobody knew that it was Drake. So I feel like that's at least good because I can't do the double trauma of having everybody know what you went through at that age. I can't even fathom it. So anyway, that was like, a very, very long recap, I guess. That's, hopefully people use the timestamps and just skip to this area if you already watched the docu-series or whatever. Today's episode is brought to you by Oak Essentials. They are a skincare brand full of luxurious products that work really well, especially if you want to achieve that natural, clean girl, no makeup type of look. Some of my favorite products of theirs, they have this moisture-rich balm. It is like heaven to me. My skin is so dry and parched, especially living here in Denver above altitude. And this is just a great rich balm that's going to make you feel like you're not dry anymore. And it's not like nighttime creams that kind of like weigh you down. You can use it during the daytime too. They also have their body routine. And these are what you use in the shower. They have the Awaken Body Wash. Don't you love the name? And then they have the Luminous Body Lotion. They also come in these nice like heavy glass bottles. I like putting a set of them in my guest bedroom. So that way I feel bougie when people come over. So treat yourself for someone else this season. My followers will get 15% off and a free organic honey-based restorative mask with their first order when they use code FLUENTLY at checkout. That's 15% off and a gift with your first order at O-A-K-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L-S.com with the promo code FLUENTLY. Go ahead and treat yourself from luxurious skincare to meaningful self-care. You deserve it. Now we are going to get into the overview of Dan Schneider, the creator of all of these Nickelodeon shows. To this day, he still doesn't have any specific like allegations against him of molesting or like sexually abusing children, but it's verbal abuse. It's emotional abuse. It's like toxic workplace. He, he sounds like an awful guy. And also he's putting all those sexual scenes into the TV show. So he's not getting a free pass from me. He's creepy and fucked up. We just don't know if he's, you know, Brian Peck type of fucked up. All right, so Dan Schneider, how do you get his start being a fucking little demon, okay? So he actually got his career start in acting. He was a bunch of teen comedy films, Making the Grade, Better Off Dead, Hot Resort, Happy Together, The Big Picture. And then he got a series regular role on the ABC sitcom Head of the Class. Then from acting, he transitioned over to writing, and that was when he started doing everything for Nickelodeon. Um, I think I already shouted out like all the TV shows. Pick one, as long as it's not animated and a cartoon. Dan Schneider was behind it. Anyway, and then he ended up being let go from Nickelodeon. We're going to get all into that. And now he is, uh, what's it called? <laughs> I can't think of the name, like Resident Umaro New, <laughs> Umaro despicable guy numero uno you guys probably know what i'm trying to say he's the most hated man right now as he should be all right so let's get into his childhood he was born in tennessee uh he got involved in theater in high school and he was also senior class president it seems like he's always been extroverted class clown putting himself out there you know trying to get a shot doing xyz now wikipedia said when i researched this that he attended harvard university but dropped out after one semester and I thought that was sus, so I looked into it. I hadn't watched the docu-series yet, and I found all of these articles saying he didn't go to Harvard, and the docu-series also said that he didn't go to Harvard. So you know what I did, and you can check over the history in Wikipedia, Shannon 7 McNamara, which is my Wikipedia username, I went in and I removed that misinformation, struck it from the history books, and I took that out. And I said, he did not go to Harvard. So now you won't find that in Wikipedia. I'm surprised it was even in there because I only edited it a few days later. I'm like, everybody's talking about Dan Schneider. Why is nobody correcting the Wikipedia page? Anyway, so he didn't go to Harvard. Liar. <laughs> Stupid. No, I'm just I, I also didn't go to Harvard. Anyway, he started repairing computers back in Tennessee and he then decided to look for a little bit of an acting gig and it kind of fell into his lap. So I also want to note too that while I was looking around to see if he did go to Harvard, he said that he wasn't a good student. So it's just like, how did, how did this stay in his Wikipedia for so long, basically? And in different interviews, he self-reflects and says that he grew up as the funny guy in class. He wasn't a good student, but he would do plays. He got that senior class president. 
He was good at being on stage, giving speeches, getting a lot of laughs, doing skits, funny stuff like that. And like I said, after high school, he was just repairing computers. He says that he was kind of floundering a little bit at this time. And that same time period, they were shooting a movie in Memphis. And it was a big deal because it was the first time that Hollywood had ever come to shoot a movie in Memphis. And his teacher in an acting class said, hey, there's a role that you might be interested. Why don't you go and you know, participate in this casting call. And the movie was making the grade. So he went, there was this huge mob of teenagers and he almost left actually, because he was like, there's too many people here. I'm not going to get it. And a guy came up to Dan Schneider and said, Hey, are you here to audition for the film? Come with me. So he went and read with this guy who turned out to be the producer. He didn't even know that Dan Schneider had an appointment to audition And he ended up getting hired for that movie. He was supposed to work on the movie for four days. It ended up being four weeks. And then they hooked him up with another film and then another film. So then he went to LA and he was like, let me see what I can do. So honestly, it was just like a shooting star moment. I mean, I'm sure he had the acting chops if he kept getting other roles, but that really is like a ridiculous story of getting truly picked out of the crowd. So then he's acting and he's also writing when he's on head of the class, he's both acting in the episodes, but he's also writing for it. And sooner or later, there's this idea being pitched around for Nickelodeon to do this sketch comedy show for children called All That. And they kind of toss his name around as somebody that could help write for it. He ends up writing for the show, doing well. The rest is history. We all, we've already talked about it. All That to Amanda Show or Drake and Josh to keep going, 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 going. He's also done movies, by the way. You know the 1997 film Good Burger? He wrote that. <laughs> and he also wrote and co-produced Big Flat, Big Fat Liar with Amanda Bynes and Frankie Muniz, which I might watch that movie tonight after I finish this. I love that movie. And I found it interesting. That movie, and this was just back in 2002, it got $42 million at the box office. And it really is, there is so much money in kids' stuff. I think about it in the sense of Miss Rachel on YouTube and all of the kids' YouTube channels. I swear to God, in another life, if I could do anything, (laughs) I would go back in time. And in high school, A, I would get on Vine and start making Vine videos and just, boom, start this career way earlier. And I would also start a YouTube channel where I'm one of those people who just play with slime for like 20 minutes a day. And then that video goes viral and a bunch of kids on YouTube watch it and you make like tons of money, honestly. Honestly, the money machine, like YouTube kids, not even to mention Disney Channel and then Nickelodeon and then the movies for the kids. It's just there's a lot of money in the industry. Anyway, then he does Drake and Josh. He does iCarly. He does Zoe 101. He does Victorious, et cetera, et cetera. Now, trouble comes for Dan Schneider in 2018 in March. And this is when Nickelodeon announces that they aren't going to be extending their production deal with Dan Schneider. And he won't be coming back for anything. And they're cutting ties with him. Rumors about Dan Schneider being creepy have been around on the internet since the first blind item was written, if we're being honest. Like, I have been hearing weird shit about Dan Schneider since forever. And I just want to say this. I do remember reading something on Reddit. And dude, like, don't look up anything about Dan Schneider on Reddit because they're so gross over there. They always say, Dan Schneider hold her tighter. She's a fighter, Dan Schneider. And like, they're just making fun of his alleged foot fetish and rhyming all of these gross things with his name. And I'm like, could you maybe give a shit about the victims? Like you're both saying that he's a pedophile rapist, but then also making so light of it. Just bizarre behavior over there anyway. But I have seen people say, we definitely know for a fact he was verbally abusive mentally, socially, spiritually, like incredibly abusive, not a good guy, weird as fuck the sexual shit that he was putting in these shows. But I have heard people say online, he's not a pedophile, but because he was this like big, large man who didn't seem like he took good care of himself, people throw that label onto him and I don't know, like demonize him as a pedophile just because he, quote, looks the part, which, you know, is something in itself. Now, look, (laughs) the last thing I'm going to do is be a Dan Schneider apologist. But I will say, as of now, so far, there's no sexual assault allegations against him. If I had a gun to my head, 
I would say something weird happened. I mean, just the fact that he was asking the kids to massage him. I feel like that kind of counts, doesn't it? Anyway, but the point being, it seems like in 2018, Nickelodeon gets rid of him because he's verbally abusive and it's a toxic workplace. There's no mention of child sexual abuse. Now, what's also interesting, too, is the different people from Nickelodeon who are talking about and not talking about Dan Schneider. So, for example, Ariana Grande, she has been very thankful and grateful to Dan Schneider since her time at Nickelodeon. She's called him a true friend of mine. She took a photo with him a few years ago. Uh, Josh Peck had Dan Schneider at his wedding. He did not have Drake Bell at his wedding. They, Miranda Cosgrove, I think, has had said nothing on it. In the other camp, Drake Bell hasn't said anything bad about Dan Schneider. Okay, obviously what happened with him and Brian Peck was horrible, disgusting. But Drake Bell did say that Dan Schneider helped him and really supported him during the abuse, you know, post the abuse that happened with him and Brian Peck. Alexis Nickel, Alexa Nicholas. I don't know why, like her name always throws me when I read it. She played one of the girls, I think Nicole, on Zoe 101. She speaks out against Dan Schneider. She basically says that every time he was on set, her body would go cold. She was completely uncomfortable. He created trauma for so many children. And Jeanette McCurdy, in her memoir, says that Dan Schneider, she refers to him as the creator. She talks about the massages. She talks about everything. It's just so... And I don't want to say, like, he's not a bad guy. He is a bad guy. If he so much has made one person uncomfortable, you're a bad guy. It doesn't matter how nice you are to other people. But I just find it very interesting that so many stars, especially with this movie having come out, are speaking out about Dan Schneider. Josh Peck, as of a couple days ago, put out a statement saying that watching the series has been really hard for him. He's been dealing with it on his own privately, but he feels awful for the victims and change needs to happen, etc. And I just want to say in here too, everybody was giving Josh Peck so much shit because they thought that like he was praising Dan Schneider. Like nobody knows that. Also like when this was happening, all of these people were kids and it just really bums me out so much when something like this, something huge comes to the surface and we have a real opportunity to change something nefarious that's going on, something systematic that's going on and everybody's just biting off the wrong heads. And it's just like Josh Peck who was, what, also 18, under 18, when all of this was going on, you really think that going after him and like leaving him all of those comments is going to like help future victims? No, it's not. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, it just pisses me off so much when people online do that because it's like, A, you don't understand how this situation actually works. If you did, you would be going to the board of directors and you would be harassing them until change happens. But instead, you're just going for this low-hanging fruit who like even if Josh Peck, you know, did things completely differently, the abuse still would have happened. So like I just don't understand why all of these people like they're going after like Victoria Justice, like you say something, Ariana Grande, like you say something. You're going after these people who are also victims? And children when it happened. I just like don't get it. Anyway, what was I talking about? I lost track. Oh, but what I was going to say is that it seems like not every person from Nickelodeon has spoken out about A, their time with Dan Schneider, and B, if something happened to them, which like they shouldn't have to if they don't want to at all. But I do think this docuseries is gaining traction at a ridiculous rate. Like I don't think we're going to hear from Ariana Grande about what happened. But Victoria Justice, maybe Miranda Cosgrove, I could see that. But other people are theorizing, was there hush money taken and given by Nickelodeon? Are there NDAs being signed? Can these people speak out or not? Um, And we're going to get to Dan Schneider's apology here soon, too. Now, something I want to talk about, number one, it's the way that Dan Schneider would ask the writers, the children, everybody for massages. And by the last episode in this docuseries, everybody's like, Dan Schneider was always getting massaged and it was so fucked up. Like he would always be sitting there and somebody was always massaging him. And it was so fucking weird. Like whenever you saw him, he was getting massaged. And I just am like, what is the weird, like what is up with all of these fuckers wanting massages? Like 
Harvey Weinstein, remember, he would come out in his bathrobe and ask for a massage, lest we forget everything that um, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell had to do with massages, so much so that they were training children to be massage therapists. And it's just like, I wonder if the spa industry right now is like, get the fuck away from us. Like, what is it with all of these creepos asking for massages? It's just like gross. Okay. Something else I want to talk about, and this I made a TikTok video about this. When I was doing all of this research, it was hard to find uh, a lot of interviews with Dan Schneider from like early, early days, but this was an interview I found. I think this was back in like 2007 or something, maybe 2012. Dan Schneider is being interviewed and the person interviewing him really fluffs up his feathers and they're like, look, I love the shows that you do on Nickelodeon because your programming for the most part isn't just dumb shows where kids make fart sounds, you know, like you're different Dan Schneider and Dan Schneider responds and he goes, I love that you get that. It sounds like you get the difference between my shows and other shows in my genre. I can't go around saying that because I don't want to sound like an egomaniac, but my shows stand in their own little niche. I'm never going to write fart jokes because I feel like I have a responsibility to the audience to give them good stuff. I should be able to come up with something funnier than any third grade boy could think of. Blah, 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 blah. And what's interesting is that after this docuseries came out, Dan Schneider puts out a 20 minute long interview slash explanation slash apology. And he's being interviewed by a former child star of iCarly who is just lobbying these softball questions at Dan Schneider. And it's very obvious that this thing was scripted and they worked on it beforehand. And I want this kid from iCarly to follow me around all day because the way he would make me feel good. Like he was like, Dan, oh, Dan, you did this well. And I I was disappointed about how they said this about you in the docuseries. And they forgot to say that you did this thing really well. And it was like, oh my God, get your nose out of his ass. Anyway, in that 20 minute interview, which I watched, Dan Schneider says when the iCarly kid is like, what do you say about all the allegations saying that you're the scenes in Nickelodeon were sexual and this was sexual scenes for children. And Dan goes, all I have to say to that is, um, we just wrote humor for kids that kids would think is funny. And the executive signed off on it. It was just stupid jokes for kids that kids would find humor in, but we can cut the scenes now if you want. So that's Dan in 2024 trying to say, oh, it's not sexual. Oh, we just did kids jokes for stupid kids, kids humor. But this interview from 10 years ago, Dan's saying in here, I don't do dumb jokes. I don't do fart jokes. I don't write something that a third grade boy would think of. I write stuff that's different and unique and quote, my shows stand in their own little niche. So this is where I got my conspiracy hat on. And I go, yeah, Dan wasn't writing cum shot jokes and foot rubbing jokes and water all over your chest jokes because it was for kids humor maybe he was writing it for a different audience and maybe that audience tuning into these shows were pedophiles i mean i'm just putting it out there i i would be curious on the stats and it's also the type of thing i was thinking about this too where even if you could collect all of the stats of the different households like some sort of census of everybody that was watching these tv shows even if it was like 40 year old man watching this tv show Well, that would also be the same group as like his kid watching it. Because, you know, when I watched TV growing up, they would probably say, my dad, Sean McNamara, you know, 50-year-old male household. But it was me as like a 13-year-old watching the TV shows. So like, I don't even know if there's like a way to tell is a kid watching this or a creepy old man. Today's episode is brought to you by Way. My hair is incredibly important to me, almost to a cripplingly high effect. If my hair looks good, I feel good. I feel more confident. I actually go outside of my house because I want to show it off. And I just find myself being a little bit more social, staying out longer because I want to show off the do. So if you want to get on your way (laughs) to good hair days in just five minutes, you can try their new hair gloss. It gives you immediate shine straight out of the shower. It smells incredible. And you can just put it on as you shave your legs 
wash your pits, <laughs> rub your pubes, exactly what you do in the shower is up to you. There's also a bunch of other great whey products. They have a leave-in conditioner, a detox shampoo. I am super into them to get all that gunk out of your scalp and a really nice hair oil. I love using that on the ends of my hair just to give them a little bounce bounce. So if you want to give your hair a glow up, you can do so with whey. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I.com and use promo code fluently for 15% off any product. That is T-H-E-O-U-A-I.com with the promo code fluently. Anyway, before we really uh, get into his apology, I just want to mention some things that I pulled from other old interviews that he's done back in the day. I thought this was very interesting. He references in a bunch of different interviews that he doesn't watch his competitor shows. He doesn't watch the Disney Channel. He doesn't watch Cartoon Network. He just doesn't do it. Hmm. Interesting. It just stuck out to me. And then somebody said, how do you know what kids want to see with changing tastes and things like that. And everybody in these docu-series, they're like, Dan is just a big kid. He's like a big softy. He's a kid at heart. Ugh. And he says, I feel like I have a very sort of young outlook on life. I like to have fun. I like to have toys. My wife, Lisa, collects vintage toys, and there's a lot of those around the house. So if you come into my house, it's a fun vibe to it. Which, by the way, pause. I need to look into his wife, Lisa. Who married Dan Schneider? Anyway, whatever. Then he just talks about how I'm a bit of a perpetual adolescent in terms of enjoying comedy and liking to have a good time. I feel like because I've stayed with Nickelodeon and because of that, I've kind of never become a stuffy grown-up adult. Maybe it's because I've never had kids myself. Because I think sometimes when you have kids yourself, that's when you kind of turn the corner and you become like, okay, I'm a real grown-up now. <sighs> I don't know. I don't really have anything to say, say on that. It's just, uh, well, I have a few things to say. <laughs> Number one, I don't think you become a real grown up when you have kids. Like I understand a little bit of that ideology, but I feel like then it's so dangerous. Like, I don't know. When do you become an adult? When you get your period? No, <laughs> you're so young, but I don't know. Definitely after you graduate college, like, I don't know. I just can't get into the mind of these people. You know what I mean? Like I see a 24 year old walking down the street and I'm like, oh, so much collagen, so much life ahead of you. Like you're so young. And that's a 24 year old. And then I look at an 18 year old and I'm like, well, you're a baby. And then I look at like a child and I'm like, well, you're a toddler. And then I look at a toddler. I think that they're a baby. I look at a baby. I see the miracle of life. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to his, um, uh, interviews here. Somebody asked what made iCarly so special to you? And he says, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people ask him, what's your favorite show you've ever created? And I always say, it's like asking a parent, who's your favorite kid? You like them all for different reasons. Zoe 101 is the most beautiful, beautifully photographed show in terms of kids TV. Drake and Josh, I think a lot of people would tell you it's my funniest show. iCarly was very special to me for a lot of reasons. It was one of those shows where everything worked out perfectly and I just loved making it. And people said in the docuseries that Dan Schneider was very into tech, into the web. He got on Twitter right away when it was created. And then he used that Twitter to ask star or fans of the show to send him pictures of their feet. That's another thing. Look that up. Anyway, but I think that could be another reason why he liked R. Carly. And they were saying in the docuseries too, I didn't know that I Carly popped off in such a big way. They were like, oh, this was the, like, the biggest TV show that Nickelodeon ever did. I'm just focused on Hannah Montana. To me, Hannah Montana was everything. Which, by the way, check out our Hannah Montana episode over on Patreon.com. Okay, let's get into Dan Schneider's apology and response. Here's what I have to say about it. You guys are going to kill me. <laughs> Before I watched the docuseries, I read a transcript of his apology. It's this 19-minute interview. And when I read the transcript, and I hadn't seen the docuseries yet, okay? So, tr uh, you know, trust me, I'm going to change my tune here. But when I read the transcript of the apology, I went, that's really good. That's a really, really good apology. He sounds really sorry. He sounds like he's taking accountability. And then I watched the docuseries, and about 15 minutes into the first episode, I went, nope, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. But holy shit. It's like Molly McPherson on steroids. Who coached him in his apology? And I know a lot of people are like, I didn't even watch it. So if you didn't even watch it and you're like yelling at me right now, you have to watch it because 
and I'm going to, you know, tear it apart to shreds here soon, but, uh, he hit all the buzzwords that you're supposed to hit in an apology. There's a lot of things that are about it that are weird. Like at the beginning, the guy asks him, how are you doing? And he's like, I'm okay. And it's like, <laughs> I'll take things that you shouldn't say in your apology for 200. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Also, he keeps saying in his apology, I owe a lot of people apologies. Do you want to maybe say the words, I'm sorry? Isn't there a thing where like narcissists or I think Dan Schneider is a sociopath. That's right. I am diagnosing people. <laughs> I am diagnosing people on the internet. I think he's a sociopath. And to back that up, I have Aunt Frodite, the celebrity psychic's YouTube reading, where he also said the same thing, okay? So I stand strong in my delusional diagnosis. But uh, isn't there some sort of thing where, like, sociopaths can't say the word I'm sorry? Or, like, they'll do anything but say the word I'm sorry? Whatever. Anyway, Dan Schneider in this interview, he's like, watching this the past two nights was very difficult. And let's be honest, he must have gotten an advanced copy because this apology dropped, like, two days after or like maybe a day after it aired. So like he was ready for it. And he keeps basically saying like, I've learned how to be a better boss. I really regret what I did. I wish I could go back in time and be a different boss. Like it's never okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. And it's like, well, what about the potato dick that you made Ariana Grande jerk off? What the fuck about that? What about the ketchup on the toes and the dicks on the shoulder and then the cum shot from the nose? Like the way that you wanted to scream while also watching this, because Dan would give these apologies to like, I forget what the exact question was, but I'll just summarize for you a little role play. Here we go of how it went in my mind. This is kind of how it went. The guy would ask Dan, oh, Dan. So there were allegations that Amanda Bynes wanted to be emancipated and that you helped her do it. And Dan would answer like this. He would go, Yes, Amanda Bynes, when she was in between the ages of 16 and 17, which by the way, pause, I caught on to that, in between the ages of 16 and 17, that's 16, you weirdo. What do you mean in between the ages of 16 and 17? You sound like a toddler being like, I'm five and three quarters. She was 16. Who says in between 16 and 17? She was 16. Anyway, what was the question? Okay, okay. Let's, let's take it from the top. So, Dan, I heard that you helped Amanda Bynes with her emancipate, trying to be emancip, emancip, trying to get emancipated from her parents. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, when Amanda was in between 16 and 17, she wanted to go through emancipation. Why am I having trouble with that? And this is a process that a lot of stars, especially back then, child stars would do. And she came to me and a few others for counsel and advice on that. And I advised her. And it's just like, what are you doing? You're not answering the question. You're basically just repeating the question, but adding more words onto it as like a state. It's not an answer. It's just like a definition. Anyway, whatever. Now, at one point, Dan Schneider starts crying and it is uncomfy. What happened when I was watching something where someone cried? Oh my God, it was when Ethan Klein and then Hassan Piker started crying. There's just, you can just tell when someone is fake crying and it is so uncomfortable anyway. And then he did this weird thing where he was like crying when they were talking about what happened to Drake Bell. And then he like stopped crying and was talking normal. And it was just weird, weird, weird. And then Dan Schneider tries to join our side at the end. So when they're talking about what happened to Drake Bell and how Brian Peck ended up getting hired again, by Disney Channel, Dan Schneider goes, here's the kicker that I really don't get. After Brian Peck got out of prison and was a registered sex offender, he was hired on a Disney Channel show. I don't understand that. And you know what I don't understand? This is something that I noticed when I was watching the docuseries. When Brian Peck was accused of this and he was going to trial, Drake says that Dan Schneider called him up and he said, Drake, I just want to talk to you were you the victim in this? And Drake said, yes. And then Drake talks about it nicely. He goes, Dan said, look, you don't have to say anything more. What can I help with? How can I support you? Et cetera, which seems nice. Now here's where I get thinking. Cause I got that conspiracy brain. Why did Dan Schneider call him up and ask if it was him? Because he probably had a suspicion. He probably had an inkling. 
if Drake's dad saw how close Brian Peck was touching Drake and everything like that, I'm sure other people on the set did. I'm sure Dan Schneider did. If Dan Schneider had enough of a suspicion to call up Drake after Brian Peck was arrested and say, hey, was this you? He probably had enough of a suspicion for months and he should have stopped something and he should have stepped in and he should have done something. Like, whatever. Whatever. Okay, what do we have here? Let's get into some of the blind items, okay? We got some blind items on Dan Schneider. This was an interesting one. I'm just going to summarize a lot of these. What time are we at? I feel like we're over an hour. Ooh, hour 10. There was a blind item where basically Showtime did this documentary about Louis C.K. And apparently Showtime's parent company is Paramount. And Paramount goes hand in hand with Nickelodeon. And Brian Robbins is the president CEO of both those companies, and he's best friends with Dan Schneider. So a lot of these blind items talk about Brian Robbins, who is involved at Nickelodeon. He's president, he's CEO, and a lot of these blind items basically just say that, look, Dan Schneider is a piece of shit, but so is Brian Robbins, which by the way, all of the teenagers on TikTok who are going after Josh Peck, there's your man right there, Brian Robbins, go after him. Anyway, so that was a blind item basically saying that Brian will protect Dan Schneider. He will protect Louis C.K. He protects sex predators. Uh, There's a lot of these blind items that I just don't want to read because they come across as children sleeping with producers on shows. And that is not a thing. That is assault. All right. Then there was a blind item talking about Jeanette McCurdy's memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died. And there was a part in here that basically says, okay, remember this. There was a part in the memoir where she said that Ariana Grande ended up at Tom Hanks' house. They like had, I don't want to say like a play date together, but they had like dinner, they played games together, something like that. The book doesn't really go into it, right? Jeanette McCurdy only knows what was told to her. But allegedly, this blind item alleges, allegedly, that Miranda Cosgrove and Victoria Justice also went over to Tom Hanks' house one day. You know me, I've had a vendetta against Tom Hanks for years now. And everybody thinks that it's crazy because I know he played like Woody and Captain Sully and he was in the Polar Express. He's like, what a nice guy. I got my eye on you, Tom Hanks. I don't like him. I think that there's something so sinister there. And honestly, we're overdue for the Tom Hanks episode because one day I will talk about it. There was another uh, blind item that basically said everything that Jeanette McCurdy put out in her book about the creator, a.k.a. Dan Schneider, there was so much more in there, but it didn't make it past legal. And I absolutely believe that blind item. There was another blind item, too, saying that when Jeanette McCurdy put out her book, she basically pointed the finger at Dan Schneider. It was very easy to tell that he was the creator. But this blind item says, quote, Nobody is going to go digging. Reporters and their editors don't want to report on it for fear that they will be accused of engaging in QAnon-like behavior. They will report on casting couch behavior, but they don't want to touch anything that smacks of underage behavior. Preach it. The blind item continues. I mean, People Magazine did their very best this week to open wide for the stand-up comic Dane Cook, and they told his publicist story verbatim. When People Magazine was offered proof that Dane Cook and his now-wife knew each other when the wife was just 15, they didn't print it. And it's just so true. Like, if I could do anything, I would go back in time and kill Q from QAnon. (laughs) Because the way that, like, the conspiracy theories had a bad rap before Trump, they now have an awful rap. I got into, like, a heated, not like a fight, but a heated discussion at a dinner party with my friend the other day because he was like, conspiracy theories aren't true. Like, tell me one conspiracy theory that is true. And I was like, MK Ultra, uh, Operation Paperclip, Jeffrey Epstein and the entire fucking island, Harvey Weinstein and all of the casting couch stuff, even the fucking food pyramid and the fact that all of the different corn, meat and dairy lobbies paid money in order to create this food pyramid that was then put on different placemats at our middle school and shown in all of our textbooks. And it's not actually the food that you should be eating, but it was paid for, which means that it, that is part of a government conspiracy theory because then they 
surfaced around this food pyramid that was just paid for by the lobbyists because they have a surplus of corn. Anyway, one day I want to do an episode on like conspiracy theories that have come true because I'm just like, look, I get it. Like there are so many like insane wackadoos out there, but I like some of the, so much of this shit has come true and nobody ever goes back in time and they're like, Oh, remember when I said that you were crazy about the Jeffrey Epstein stuff? So sorry about that because it turned out that you were right. Mm, You never get a sorry. Anyway, but what I mean is like the conspiracy theories before Trump, it was mostly fun, man. We were so hooked on aliens and then Trump came along and Q came along and it turned into, you know, the deep state and the cabal of pedophiles, which, uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, like, you know, the jury's out on that. But it turned into like there are tunnels underground Central Park and Donald Trump is rescuing the children from the pedophiles and the COVID with the vaccine. And like the past few years, man, it's not been good for conspiracy theories. We need a new name for it. But that being said, like QAnon and, you know, there's even a part of a greater conspiracy theory that says QAnon was created by pedophiles So then that way, anytime you reference child sexual abuse or anything going on like that, you're called QAnon and written off as crazy and ignored, which is exactly what the pedophiles want, which is why they created QAnon. Now, look, that's like a whole rigmarole thing. But I will just say I'm really happy for legitimate docuseries that are done properly with journalists and investigation and eyewitness and victim testimony, because I think that is what this topic needs because people need to be taking it seriously. Like I I don't want this shit to be going around on like Twitter or X threads. I want it to be reported on because I think the severity of it and how it's everywhere is is really going to freak people out, but it's necessary to know. There was another blind honestly a lot of these blind items like I'm already feeling kind of sick to my stomach. I don't know if I want to read all of these. Um there was, you know, speaking of the president CEO of Nickelodeon, Brian Robbins, if you type in Brian Robbins, Meghan Markle, and Prince Harry, they are kind of buddy-buddy now, which, like, look, <laughs> the last thing I'm saying is that, like, Meghan and Harry are, like, pedophiles. I'm just saying this guy, Brian Williams, needs to be taken down because, of course, people are buddying up to him. He's in charge of Nickelodeon. He's in charge of Paramount. Like, if you want to get into entertainment, you have to work with him, but this is not a good guy. So somebody tell Meghan and Harry Brian Williams is, or sorry, Brian Robbins is going down. There's a blind item about how, you know, something bad happened to Miranda Cosgrove, but she, quote, get got to have a comeback because she kept her breakdown to herself and didn't broadcast her life to the world and how she continues to struggle in the aftermath of the show. I will be curious if Miranda Cosgrove speaks out. She, you know, she hasn't said anything yet. But then we have another blind item that says this former a list teen actress, Miranda Cosgrove, who had her own show has nothing booked no matter how hard she tries. She spent a weekend with a producer who said that he would cast her, but then he didn't. She has tried red carpets and promo modeling, but nothing is working. Her only hope is that something that has been in the can for a long time, a reboot of her show, is going to see the light of day. I feel like her former boss is somehow behind her, shunning, because she wouldn't play his game. So that blind item alleges that like she wouldn't play Dan Schneider's game, and now he's blocking her from getting work. I really haven't seen Miranda Cosgrove in a lot of stuff, but I know she went to um, college, didn't she? Because I think my cousin went to college with her. And then this is like a gross one of details. It basically says that Dan Schneider used to paint Ariana Grande's toenails while her feet were in his lap. Okay, a lot of these are like too gross. I, what time are we at? We're at like 120. I think I'm going to do a Wednesday mini and that's where I will talk about Drake And can I say it correctly? Let's take a guess. Alexa Nicholas. There we go. Finally. So I think that will be a little Wednesday mini. But let me know what you think of all of this. Have you seen the show? Um, The series? I highly suggest you watch it. It's a hard watch. Like it's it's not going to make you feel happy afterwards. But I think it's important. And it's really great gaining traction like crazy right now. So I think even just to be a part of the zeitgeist, you should watch it just to be aware of what everybody's talking about. So that's a little bit about quiet on the set, a little bit about Dan Schneider who did not go to Harvard bitch. (laughs) And on Wednesday, I think we will cover the mini of Drake bell, the turmoil in his life, his own allegations of engaging with underage victims. Um, 
his blind items and a little bit about Alexis Nicholas. So thank you for hanging out with me. I wish I could say that Wednesday is going to be a fun episode, but I don't think it will. But this past Friday over on Patreon, I did a deep dive all about Wendy Williams, which was both fun and then also deeply sad. Oh my God, it's been so sad. And then this next Friday, Christy and I recorded another Patreon talking more about A, quiet on the, quiet on the set, also B, continuing our episode series where we talk about hot female celebrities and if being hot hinders you or helps you in Hollywood because different ladies have different things to say. So you can check out all of that on patreon.com slash fluently forward. Thank you all for hanging out with me and I will see you on Wednesday for a mini episode of Fluently Forward. Bye guys.